Hello, everybody. I am here with the man who has made Star Trek what it has become <laughs> and the executive <laughs> producer of my favorite Star Trek show on right now. No offense to anyone else's, no one else to all, no offense to any, all the other Star Treks, but my personal favorite Star Trek show, Mike McMahon, Star Trek Lower hey, Decks producer. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be back. Round yeah. two or round yeah. three? I don't I mean, know. I can't remember anymore. I think it's round two. Round I believe. two on YouTube, but now we uh, now we see each other at weddings and at conventions. <laughs> exactly. And I'm always, uh, and and then my producer Brad always spots you first, and and he's always like, "Oh, there's Jesse!" And we always come running over. Well, legitimately, it was it was kind of funny because uh, I was like excited to talk to both of you at the wedding and like actually have like a conversation. But then, well, most of it was just you two like ranting at me about season three. Like, what did you think of this? What did you think of this? And I was like, <laughs> uh, OK, geez, you nerds. God, well, we know you're going to we know that if we messed up, you're going to tell us and and uh, we'll hear it from you first. And uh, it doesn't often happen. But um, I think also, you know. Brad and I are really old. Like, I think you're like our <laughs> only YouTuber we watch. Everybody else has like lots of YouTubers, but like you're the only person Aww. that we watch. Oh, I feel very, that's very touching. <laughs> <Actually>. <laughs> well, uh, we're in our forties, so you can't be too touched. So you know you're, you're just, you're just old and decrepit now. That's what that means, right? Ancient, Being in your forties. Yeah. yeah. My son plays a voice. He's eight. He plays a voice on Solar Opposites. Oh, really? And I'm like, isn't that cool? And he's like, yeah, I guess it's cool. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, what I really want to be is a YouTuber. And I'm just like, you yeah, can't win. He that's can't. so that's so funny because like I would love to do that sort of stuff. And I'm like, I'm jealous of you is like, dang it. It's like everyone I just know. I'm the like, grass is always day, greater. Yeah. One day he'll be super successful and have a YouTube channel and I won't be able to make fun of him for it. But I, I, I either way, I'll be fine with it. <laughs> it's funny because, yeah, my dad, my my dad does the same thing where I like call him for advice. Like, what do you think about like this career thing is like, I don't know. I, why are you talking to me? If I were you, yeah. I would have just taken the normal job and I support yeah. you fully, but I don't understand what's going on. And he's like a lawyer or whatever. So it's like at my age, I I was just, this is what I was doing. <laughs> well, listen, I'll tell you, my dad was an industrial litigator in Chicago and also didn't understand any of the stuff I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. So at least YouTubers and regular tubers are united by that. Yeah. It's like, I want to go to Hollywood and be in the stars. Like, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. You do that, kid. <laughs> sure. Well, you'll be back to Chicago soon enough is really like, the going phrase like all right cool well we'll see you when you're back yeah yeah um well now that we've bored all of my viewers who don't care mm -hmm. about us just chatting and want to just actually hear about star trek and Welcome, everybody. yeah um how do you feel about season three now that it's done i i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it it's so funny i i mean i love season three i think like we get more confident every year on lumber decks and mm -hmm. i think that like you know, if you had to look at it from the macro point of view, first season was me proving to myself, to the network, to Secret Hideout, that we could do this show and kind of like throwing everything at the wall, like finding mm. what kind of episodes do I like to do? What kind of character stories? How fast do the characters evolve? How fast do they not evolve? How often can we undercut stuff? You know, and then going into season two, we kind of laid this bedrock of like every episode is to me playing one of the hits you mm -hmm. know like i remember when we got to like the end of season one and it was like the trial episode and the holodeck episode and the very last episode i was like what have we not done yet that feels very star trekky and i was like oh we haven't done an episode that means something that has like mm -hmm. a parallel to um something that's happening politically in the real world you know and that's that's where like these kind of fascist pack leads came from and in, in our own silly lower decks way right and then yeah, yeah. Season two, we wrote and started producing season two before anybody saw season one, you know, so like, and that happens every year. So uh, season two, I was really proud of stuff like, you know, introducing the character of Kayshawn being like, okay, mm -hmm. we can dig in deep and, and our audience isn't going to be flummoxed by bringing a Tamarian onto the ship and, you know, um, going and doing Wage Douge, which I was so proud of and Still, so big, amazing favorite, finale. Yeah. I got my favorite bar from Chicago on a space station in the middle of the season with Mariner and Boimler. And then once the pandemic had kind of like slowed down a bit, when we went to Mission Chicago, Tony and Jack and I all went to that bar and hung out. And, and Oh, that was the same. Like, I, I saw that you posted that picture while we were yeah. at Mission Chicago. I didn't know that was, was the same a bar. Trip. And it was a trip finding out, uh, seeing Chicago people res respond to seeing Jack and Tony <laughs> and being like, 
uh, uh, blown away. And then, um, and then, yeah, season three, I'm really, really proud of because I think we tried to do a lot of different stuff. We had a season long villain arc. Mm -hmm. We revealed some stuff about Rutherford. We really stayed true to the show, but we also, we took some, some big swings on, on things that characters had threatened to do, like Mariner leaving Starfleet or getting kicked out of Starfleet. And we were like, well, let's, let's see what would actually happen with that. Like what would be a story where that actually happened? And, you know, getting to do the, uh, the peanut hamper episode I love doing, I was cracking up the entire production of that. Cause like, I adore that. Yeah. I, I love that episode. It's a very simple, silly episode that we could never, I don't think we ever could have gotten away with in like the nineties on like TNG or even Deep mm -hmm. space nine. But like that episode is based on, the lower decks episode of tng like it's like let's do a big departure episode about characters that nobody really thinks about and see some stuff that's happening with them and then obviously like play it for comedy but also show a redemption story and call it a redemption story for somebody who is trying to force a redemption story and then not being redeemed for it like was just making me laugh. i love that episode and um I I that love was Heather who plays Peanut Hamper. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry, I mean cut you off. You're the person that I'm, I'm here to listen to. No, but no, no I, I, I love, uh, I love that episode personally because two things. Jumping off what you're saying, like this season, I could definitely tell there was much more confidence because normally I know you like to do like the ninth episode of every season, both in this and Solar Opposites, to be like the weird one. But yeah. this one, there was like three in a row that were yeah. like doing something new and weird. So I was like impressed by that. But I also really love that peanut hamper one, not just because I've been quoting that that sing to me line and just caca. My friend and I literally have been doing that uh, to each other the, over the past few months. Um, <laughs> but I, I loved it because it is also like a commentary on, in again, the Lower Dexian way on like how Starfleet will just show up at a place and like sort of judge people being like, oh, this is the, the savage like race. They don't have technology. Yeah. And you like flip that on its head a few different ways, which I thought yeah. was really clever. Yeah. And I think Star Trek isn't the only sci-fi property that has utilized indigenous people metaphors like that, like over the years and they're still doing it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like there's a reason that that episode like when you find these modern mythologies that are kind of a pastiche of a bunch of different storytelling where it's like, oh, it's like Avatar. It's like Dances with Wolves. It's like The Last Samurai. It's like Fern Gully. It's like that means it's not like any of those. It means it's like a trope. Yeah. It, it's a it's a modern American myth that we keep telling over and over for some reason. Mm -hmm. And like sort of kicking the tires on that and being like, is this a cool myth to have? Because feels like down the line we're gonna look back on all of these and be like uh it's not quite as cool as we thought it was um and also just getting to do an episode with a character that is a hundred percent voice with no with no acting on it mm -hmm. and have them still be funny and unlikable and and like that was just it's just it, it makes me laugh like i just think that that's very funny to me so i love the peanut hamper episode i love the last two episodes bringing in the california class at the end with mm -hmm. that with that that Tawny performance and that Chris Westlake music, like, even though it's like, again, a thing we've seen kind of before, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, calling all of our friends to come and help. But in this case, you know, it was kind of like, not only is it California class ships we've, we haven't heard of before, but it's also like, the ones that you we've know, seen like one. Yeah. We've seen them once, you know, like yeah. bringing back Ramsey and bringing back, you know, crews from first season that like, unless you've binged it recently, like you saw them two years ago and why would you ever, you know, why would you ever worry about it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I like doing that. And I also liked ending the season on a happy note on like to Lynn is there, you know, I kept saying over and over to Lynn is not in this season. I didn't want to add like partially, I didn't want to add her. I didn't want to change the dynamic of the main four mm -hmm. too soon. Like adding to Lynn before, you know any earlier would be like fewer seasons than an actual like live action you know old school star trek season would get you know mm -hmm. like um because there's like, like 26 yeah yeah exactly we wouldn't even have been at 26 now we're at 30 and it feels right and the stories we're telling about her in season four are really fun and it's nice to have energy that's different among those four and, mm -hmm. and i can't wait for you guys to to see those stories um but just like the promise of coming together at the end of season three and like 
you know, Mariner's got a different energy, like Boimler's in the bear pack, Talin is on the ship, like it, it it just feels good. And that's one of the notes that actually Kurtzman gave me the very first episode was like, it's always it's always a good bet to end on a happy moment, to end mm-hmm. on people having resolved some stuff, you know, like it's always tempting, especially in drama, to end on unresolved sort of bleakness. But like there's like something about letting the audience trust that you aren't going to always treat them to like a sad sandwich at the end of an episode. <laughs> yeah. And, then, you know, we tucked that little bit with Badgie in to the very end after the credits, but like that was originally the last scene and we moved it to the end of the credits. Cause I was like, you know what? I don't even care if people miss it because I want them to feel really good at the end of the episode. And and hopefully people did. I, I, I mean, I most definitely did. And I, I like that because that the badgy bit kind of feels like a promise for ongoing storylines rather than like a grim note to end on. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so it feels like you concluded the story where you did. And then this is just sort of like, oh, this is another added bit. Yeah, um, that's a promise for more was what I wanted the tone to be like, mm-hmm. especially because I was like, when we wrote that and made it, we didn't know we had more. Yeah. Like, Every season, we don't know. We don't know if we have more right now. Like we're making season four, but there's no guarantee of a season five. And so every year I'm like, do I end this? Like, I remember growing up, I used to watch ALF. And do you know Mm -hmm. what the final episode of ALF was? No, no, I have no idea. Uh, It it. was a first part of a two-parter where ALF is surrounded by FBI agents with their guns drawn and then they never made another episode. So I don't, you don't ever want to end your series like that uh, Mm -hmm. uh, intentionally. So I try to... You know, I try to end in a way that says, like, let's say the series ended at season three, which it didn't, which is great. So Mm -hmm. no panic. But if we had ended there, it would have felt like those characters were going to keep going, whether you were watching them or not, which makes me feel really happy. Like, determined endings bum me out a little bit. I I literally wrote, because I'm writing my um, season review, um, I'm judging you right now uh, and and grading your work. But uh, one of the things that I wrote about it was like, if this had been a series finale, if you told me like, this is the last episode, I was like, I would have been sad personally, but I would have felt like it was a good resolution. And one of the things too, that even fits with that was, um, and this may also pointed out too, and I, I wanted to ask your thoughts on it too, was looking at that final episode, like the last two seasons we had kind of big cameos and sort of like, here's the next generation or Deep Space Nine or Voyager reference that we're going to make with like Riker coming in or Selena Gomez. And I love that. It's wonderful. And I love how you evolve those characters. But uh, this one was like, oh, the cameos that we get are from Lower Decks, like everyone's yeah. Lower Decks here, uh, as opposed to like referencing another show. And that just showed me how much like this show was its own thing and resolving its own storylines. Yeah, it's it's... I'm 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 glad you said that because there is like a, it, it was it's crazy the feeling I get like like getting to direct, direct George Takei right mm-hmm. was amazing and then seeing him in the episode, to me it really worked like the that moment really worked well, and that warm fuzzy feeling I get from seeing him in the show, it's it's the same I get from seeing Talin and like enter at the end and I feel like that means that we're doing that we're doing the right thing you know what I mean that, yeah like, we yeah. Can, that way about our own characters and we've only seen to for seven minutes or less on screen before so like knowing that and and you know we're always talking about like how much heart do we have right and mm-hmm. and the amount of heart the amount of comedy the amount of star trek but also like storytelling and personal storytelling it's all the stuff we're balancing at all at all times you know and like for some time sometimes the balance gets off for people because on top of all of that I never want people to know what's coming. Like, I think that there's a certain level of comfort. And this is a disagreement I have with, with networks sometimes. Like, I'll get a note on this being like, don't do that. And I'm like, no, that's that's what I like to do is usually TV is made to be comforting, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's why you can put it on in the background. That's why you can, like, make dinner while you watch a show or, like, why, why you put it on on a plane. Like, it's like made to not challenge you you know what i mean like it can be challenging but it's like not in a way that that makes you feel like you don't know what's going on but Mm -hmm. i personally like having grown up watching tv like when i know what's about to happen i get really checked out and then when it's just you know what i mean like no i'm having the same feeling with like uh to use a different big sci-fi french is like star wars andor right now where it's like that is such a complete take on star wars that's its own thing that like oh i don't know what to expect with this even though it's branded star wars i love andor i loved that heist episode holy Mm -hmm. shit Mm -hmm. i was just like 
slapping the couch being like <laughs> and i like that andor feels to me like star wars can do multiple things just like how star trek is doing like i mm-hmm. think star trek maybe got ahead of that a little bit star wars beat us to really good kids animated stuff for a really long time you know what i mean yeah um not that it's a contest like i think like you know star wars being better or worse than star trek is an idea from before streaming and like all things were available to everybody like everybody should be watching farscape and star trek and stargate and and star wars like what do you like why wouldn't you it's Um, like well you 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 all inspire each other to do better and learn from each other like i'm assuming you as a like a star trek writer and as a star wars fan like look at that show it's like oh what's something i could learn from this to make lower decks better as opposed to like oh i'm gonna beat them you know yeah it's like less of a beat them thing and it's more like everybody's doing their own thing but you're doing it to like make people happy in different ways Mm -hmm. and it's like we're just in a moment where like you can do cool big genre stuff like there's two huge fantasy shows on right now you know what i mean like it's not it used to be when I was a kid, I would like breathe a sigh of relief when I got to do a sci- see a sci-fi or a fantasy thing. Like it used to be every once in a while, which is why nerds used to be such big readers because that was our domain. You know what I mean? Like that's yep. where you get that stuff all the time. And now it's like, you've got so many channels that are kind of filling the niche publisher like zone. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I, I like, I'm like, go even crazier. Like make all of those old, old expanded universe Star Wars books into shows and movies just call them expanded universe i don't give a shit like yeah watch all that stuff give me my dash rendar show um (laughs) oh god (laughs) but uh but yeah i do think that like like the peanut hamper episode is one of those things where it's like oh the audience will never see this coming and that's why i like Mm -hmm. it you know and then some of the audience bristles at that and some of the audience you know it's the same thing where it's like oh how long will it take to get captain freeman back onto the cerritos and it's like Oh, really quickly. You know what I mean? And a lot of people are like, well, I wanted to see that play out over a long period of time. And it's like, cool, then you'll love Discovery. You'll love Strange New Worlds. Like Star Trek is giving you that too. Like I'm doing, I'm doing a thing where sneakily, I want to, I want to do it all, but not be confined by the rules in a way, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what comedy does, you know? And so I, I see like people's critiques of the show sometime and I never think that they're wrong, but I do in the back of my head think, in four or five years, when you go back and watch all of this, will you wish that you didn't get this kind of fun mix of all these different things you didn't expect? Will you wish you hadn't gotten that because you can go back and watch a longer sort of form thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's it's what lets me like, the amount of stuff we jam into Lower Decks. Like, I think the number one critique that is very honest and and that I can't really fight back on is like, I wish this was longer. I wish there was more. I wish there was more scenes with this character or with this with this couple or this storyline. And it's like, for me, it's almost like, you know, any little moment that everybody gets in these episodes is a choice. Like, that's a thing that I've had to take from something else. So if it's in there, it's intentional. You know what I yeah. mean? No, my two things on that, like one, uh, to sort of react to you saying, um, like you like to experiment and do different things. It's why I, I love Lord X and it's why I constantly say to people, like, I, I love Strange New Worlds. I love Discovery and all the other ones going on right now. But I always point to like your show and Prodigy as well as like, this is where like Star Trek 10 years from now is going to draw from. Like Star Wars does right now, like all the Disney Plus shows are pulling from Clone Wars or whatever, Rebels. Sure. And it's like, 10 years from now, people are going to look at Lower Decks and like, oh, what worked here? What what were the weird things that Mike McMahon and company did <laughs> that we can like now put on and and give to like the the big screen and not to disparage like you do like the work to like experiment and play and like push what Star Trek can be. And that's what I really love about Lower Decks so much. And then the second thing, too, and I'm just complimenting you, so uh, apologies, <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, the thing that I'm always impressed by um, is the fact that like you uh like every scene even when it's just stuff in the background feels like oh i can get a full story uh out of this little bit that we're just sort of seeing in these small moments so like the um shacks into anna scene in episode four where they're yeah. in the holodeck it's like we get a whole arc of their relationship that we yeah. don't really can't really see too much in like other like focus on for whole episodes like that would have been a whole tmg episode with them yes yeah but here we get it in a scene and it feels like oh you're very concise and deliberate um but you feel like like you're getting a lot out of every single minute on the show. Well, some of that is like the lower decks tone of 
they don't ever know what's going on. And they like, I want the audience to be like, wait, are those two dating? Like, it felt like they were. And like, you find that stuff. And I also, I talk a lot of times about, I want it to feel like anybody on the show could have an entire pocketbook about them. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And yeah. like, like, I love a character that doesn't get enough screen time, but every second that he's involved is Billups. Mm-hmm. And I love his backstory. I love, like, I have a whole pocketbooks novel in my head called uh, Billups, The Adventures of the Dry Prince back when he's like <laughs> on his home planet. And like, that's where I think like novels and um, expanded media, like comic books and video games. And like, like, I like, you know, I like the thought of being like, oh, could you go and do an, an entire like, like a uh, 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 comic book run about Ransom when he's at the Academy, when he's a lower decker, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like all those different kind of things. Like it just, it just brings me a lot of joy. And I think that like, it all fits into the other theme of Lower Decks, which is, wouldn't it be funny to do a show that's a half hour comedy that's animated, that is insanely dedicated to fitting into canon while also being impossible to be in canon? You know, yeah. and like that's the biggest surprise of the show that when you watch it, you're like, oh, this is going to be disposable and stupid and make fun of Star Trek. But it's it's like it instead you're like, oh, guess what? It actually loves Star Trek more than any other Star Trek ever has. And and that's like I'll never get to do a show like that again. Like that's and I don't even think there's a Star Wars that loves Star Wars as much as Lower Decks loves Star Trek. Like yes. fitting in the Star Trek rules is part of our bit like that brings us joy and and i answer so many other interviews about like what's the process of making sure you get easter eggs in there and it's like i always have to be careful because the real answer is the easter eggs make us laugh like getting to getting to do a funny show that cares about a prop there was a prop in the finale where billups goes hey toss me the the it's like i'm gonna get it wrong but it's like toss me the something that looks like a face discriminator was because (laughs) I was looking up like engineering tools at one point and I had read a, I'd read like a memory alpha article, like, like a year before that, that was like, Oh, on Voyager, they reuse this prop as this. And now they're calling it a face discriminator. So I was like, Oh, "Oh, I have to have a character be like, Hey, toss me the thing that looks like a thing because it was a reused prop. And you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. And like that kind of stuff, like, like I want people to like, there's this, there's this, uh, there's this whole job in foundation or is it in foundation? It might be in, uh, it might be in um, fire upon the deep or those, those novels, but it's a, uh, it's like techno archeologists that are like digging into ancient code and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's foundation. That feels like foundation. It might be in both. There, there's, there's I mean, somebody, Asimov wrote, yeah, like kind of there's somebody in a tweed jacket out there watching this being like, it's in both. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the idea that like in the future geeks will have to be like archaeologically digging in to be like, wait, this is a thing we didn't even find when it first aired. Like I, especially Brad Winters is so funny. He's like on a quest to find an Easter egg. That's like a undecipherable thing. That's like, he's like always digging into the archives being like, I want to find unused early designs and like reuse those and, and, Mandalorian does that pretty fun too with like using the original, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, but, but that's, that's like part of the fun to us, you know? Yeah. Like just the, like the amount that you've like, my favorite one that I think you have is the, the rubber ducky room reference in season two. Which I <laughs> love Cause I always remember just seeing those schematics where there's the rubber duck that I think was it uh, Okuda put on there. Yeah, that I, I just yep. <laughs> and yeah, A lot of it is like stuff that was always in TNG, but didn't make it on screen, but is mm-hmm. in, our heads as being part of the canon Mm. because we consumed it because we were like it was raining one day and we read the technical manual you know what i mean like i love having a character like tendy saying oh let's go to the rubber ducky room like that's ludicrous that that's in a real star trek show it makes me so happy yeah and uh like and then you get to explore it in lower decks not even in those ways but like uh episode four too uh where you have like the uh beta ship just like go through the different parts of the ship and like get to be inside the deflector dish which is like <laughs> all of us uh like ship nerds are just like oh yeah show me that deflector dish i want to see I the inside yeah, dig around in that manual just be in my books no i know i love 
I love that. And I love the master systems display where you can see how it all works. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I also love that the Cerritos is big enough is that every season you can learn another little piece of the puzzle of it in a way. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, yeah. like the 10 hidden decks underneath the 27th deck of the, of uh, the enterprise or whatever. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly. like, what's down there. That's not yeah, yeah, yeah. being like, Oh, I guess there's more, there's more down there. Oh, there's a barbershop down there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it uh, all just feels very Star Trek-y to me, and it also doesn't get in the way of enjoying the show, you mm -hmm. know? No, I think it's, like, part of the enjoyment of the show. It's, like, getting to see those nooks and crannies of Trek that you don't get to see otherwise. Um, I did want to ask you, so I, just because of my own uh, interest, like, watching the show, I did <laughs> want to talk to you about, like, Jennifer and Mariner, too. Yeah, let's do it. Because I know, I know we kind of DM'd back and forth a little bit about them. Um, But I, I just wanted to hear from you, like, your thoughts on, like, their relationship uh, this yeah. season. Yeah. Uh, because it, it was one that I, I, part of like the critique that you had earlier was just like, oh, you have to move so fast. That was one thing that I even told you that I was like, oh, I, I didn't buy in episode nine that Jennifer would sort of not trust Mariner. But yeah. then when you pointed out to me, like, oh, there's all these little hints of their relationship. I know. Yeah. I might've been too clever by half with that. I think, I think something I have to learn as a writer is that like a relationship that makes you feel happy, you're you're never going to be okay with that ending unless mm -hmm. it's like, you almost have to like do more work on screen for people to be okay with it ending. So for me, like, not that, not that anybody, uh, I'll caveat this with like, I think we could have used one more Jennifer story mm -hmm. for this to have landed. And that would have had a lot more weight. And I, I regret not having done that, but I'll, I'll give you the math on it of like why we ended up in yes, this area. Yeah. And, but I don't want anybody out there to think that, if they're mad at me for having the Jennifer stuff turn out like this, you're not wrong to feel like that. I probably should have had another story for it, but at least here's why I did it. Mm -hmm. Is when we first meet Jennifer, uh, she's laughing at Mariner um, in the bar uh, because Boimler's uh, telling a story that makes Mariner look like a fool. And then the next time we see Mariner in first season uh, with Jennifer, she's shoving Jennifer up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then the next time we see her, Jennifer is a part of the red shirts and the red shirts are, are not, supposed to be characters that we fall in love with like they're very you know they're flawed they're not terrible but they're flawed right mm -hmm. and and what you really want to feel like is like that moment when boimler says to them that's not how i am like you understand why boimler is in a friend group with these other beta shifters like these yeah. are our guys you know what i mean and so jennifer being a part of that group gives her a little bit of like an unlikability that i i wanted to utilize later and then at the end of the season at the end of that season, Mariner hits it off with Jennifer in a way that I thought was very clear, but some people apparently didn't think it was clear, uh, where, you know, she admits that she kind of has a thing for Jennifer. And mm -hmm. the thing she has for Jennifer is it's based in a traumatic moment where, where you know, Mariner's being saved on the hull of the ship. It's based in this kind of like grade school attraction to somebody that like, you don't get along with that like is very outside of your friend group. And like, it's, it's supposed to be a moment where you see Mariner making an attempt to let people in a little bit more, but mm -hmm. at the same time, like I wanted to tell a story about a relationship that didn't work out in your twenties, that not everybody who starts dating somebody, it doesn't always work out for various reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of that reason is that Jennifer doesn't really know Mariner. Like you see this in the season where like Mariner's kind of afraid in the in the episode with the glowing orbs of getting into a into a more committed relationship with Jennifer there's like a a hint that like they're not being 100% emotionally honest with each other you know but that's not a big crime or anything it's just a beginning of a relationship kind of thing and then there's the episode where Mariner has to go and hang out with more of Jennifer's friends and like you you can you learn a lot about people from their friend group right mm -hmm. and like Jennifer's friends are like they're a little snobby. They're a little like, like they like to get together and do salons. They're a little full of themselves. And like, it's funny. Cause like I have friends like that and I love that they do that stuff. It's just not my bag. You know what I mean? And yeah. like Mariner feeling out of place, like wanting to belong. And then at the end of that episode, Jennifer being like, no, what I really like about you is you're not like my friends, like fuck my friends, like zap my friends. You know what I mean? Like, and that in the episode feels like a sweet thing right mm -hmm. but it's also a weirdly like it's treating mariner like a prop it's like I was jennifer put her in a situation that wasn't cool because she knew mariner wasn't going to get along with her friends and that's the first hint of like 
does Jennifer see Mariner like we do as like a full person or does she see her as like a bad girl who's predictably going to be bad right and it's also like shows like her like as you're saying objectifying and kind of fetishizing her in a way and it it makes sense too out of like what her uh experience with Mariner is up to that point like up until that point it's like Mariner's like shoved her aside and so for someone to like you be into that as like your like the starting place for your relationship feels yeah. like oh you must be kind of into like Mariner's like rebellious nature uh which Mariner herself this season is kind of trying to deal with herself like yes. rebelling against Starfleet yeah Mariner's always dealing with the themes of like who am I? I want to affect change. I'm not good at this. I'm powerless. I'm like dealing with shit that we haven't even, that we haven't even seen yet. And then it culminates in this moment in nine where the whole ship is turning on Mariner. And then she goes to the person who should know her the best. Like Mm -hmm. I remember when I realized that I should propose to my wife, I was like having a terrible day at work and I was driving home. And I remember thinking to myself, God, fucking, I hate, I hate this job. I hate all this, like, like I'm so miserable and thank God I'm going to get to go and hang out with her tonight. And that Mm. moment of being like, Oh, like we're partners in knowing each other. You know what I mean? Like that feeling of like home that you get from the right person. And now people are also being like, I thought this, I thought this YouTube was going to be (laughs) We're just um, dealing with like relationships. I love my wife. I'm sorry. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, um, the idea that like it meant it, it, it was really, really heavy for me that Mariner would run not to her friends, like that the first person she would encounter after being accused by the captain of doing this thing, this like betrayal, right? Mm -hmm. Would be Jennifer. And that Jennifer would be so quick to be absolutely sure that Mariner had done the thing that people were accusing her of. And then Mariner says to her, you know me, I don't, I didn't do this. And that's where Jennifer should go okay hold on let's unpack that what do you mean mm-hmm. and instead doubles down on being like oh don't give me that shit i know you and yeah that's where mariner is like oh this is a mistake like that moment when mariner is walking away like mariner had just spent a season opening up and then this is what like people turning on her and people leaving her especially like that is something that mariner doesn't handle well mm-hmm. and so then Mariner goes to her friends and at least her friends, they don't handle it perfectly either, but they're like, look, we can go to the captain. We can talk this out. We know you didn't do this. Like they have a baseline of trust with her, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and then Mariner does, you know, as she goes out to Starbase 80 and deals with all of those schmoes over there. But like that moment with Jennifer was a moment that to me is something Jennifer can't come back from. Like that is a betrayal. That's an emotional betrayal that indicated to me that you shouldn't want them to get back together. And Mm -hmm. what I didn't realize is a lot of people would be like, oh, Jennifer owes her a big apology and stuff once she knew the truth. But the thing to me was that Jennifer owed her listening to her and trusting her before it was revealed to her. And then there's one final moment for Jennifer. So the, the finale is so dense. We've got so much going on. We've got Mariner and Petra. We've got a mission race we've got a bad guy we've got these these this huge action sequence like we've got the beginning where you're you're on you're on earth and like there's still we don't get more minutes for the finale you know what i mean and then yeah. at the end i wanted to like end on this happy note have a badgy moment and i wanted mariner to have to reconcile with her mom and with her friends and with with ransom and i wanted to lynn to come in and it's like all of, to fit all of that in and and also get this moment with Jennifer felt like a thing to me. Mm-hmm. So when she when Mariner comes in, like we reworked that moment where she passes Jennifer a couple times because I was like, this is the only Maybe. moment we get of closure for this storyline with Jennifer, and I need the audience to visually and instantly know how Mariner feels about Jennifer. And Mariner walks right past Jennifer. Jennifer looks up, sees her looks guilty for a moment, but Mariner keeps moving forward and then immediately is in it with Boimler, with Ramsey, with all of these people who actually care, about, care about her. her. Yeah. And like who do make mistakes. They're not perfect, but like, well, Ramsey's pretty perfect, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. but Jennifer, like to me, that was like, oh, by coming back, Jennifer's not a part of the equation for Mariner. 
She's mm-hmm. got bigger fish to fry and she's got people who actually care about her. Mm-hmm. But that moment for me, because it took up space that I was like trying to Tetris every single thing in, I think it just blew past. And I think that like, possibly because I'm like a straight white guy that's like, doesn't know how important it is to like, I know I know intellectually how important it is to have these stories share equal time on screen with, with mm-hmm. stuff that we've always seen with kind of like, you know, uh, heteronormative couples that like I needed to be a little bit more careful and land that plane a little more like a passenger plane and less like a navy plane. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I'm like in hindsight, I, I I don't I'm not even sure how I would have handled it, but that was my attempt at a rounded story. I know that was a long explanation. No, no, it were it, it I I everything you said I, I think I agree with and it reads to me and I think like a few things for my own my own thoughts on it is like I do think like yeah if there had been one more story to like kind of uh, like draw out that element of the relationship how they don't see each other or how Mar- Mariner is sort of like objectified by Jennifer as like this rebellious person that Mariner herself is evolving beyond this season that I think I think I think that would have helped crystallize it a little bit more but it, all the pieces are there and then for all for that final moment I think what people were looking for because I saw it in my comments for the review of the episode was the moment where like Mariner looked at Jennifer and made the intentional choice to not no. see her as opposed no. to just going by her. But I think that also the way you explain it also works, but I think like the intentionality of it, just no, because it of the queer relationship. I think the like, way I explain it almost works. Like I think there's a difference between the math being there, which I was doing mm-hmm. and it really feeling like it. And I think like, I think that was a bit of a stumble, but like it's technically all there, but technically all there doesn't cut it sometimes. And like, you know, I feel bad that I let people down, but at the same time, like, I just don't like Jennifer. Like, I like <laughs> Mariner. I like Ramsey. I like the other stories we tell. And there was mm. a part of me that, like, you know, I I also like that people like the show enough that that is something that bumps them out. And I and I hope, I hope that isn't something they feel all the time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, I would love. That's the other thing is like like we were saying earlier, like <clears throat> the feeling that there could be a whole novel about something you saw for a second. Mm-hmm. that's how I always felt about you know Mariner and Jennifer that like you could do a comic series in when about they're dating and see more of that but like on screen when I only get 10 22 minute episodes like it, it, it's like being at a buffet and filling your plate so much that like there's nothing really gets room and that's that's a part of the navigation of of Lower Decks that like I'm always working on that I'm always trying to be better at but like mm-hmm. I'm always trying to do so much in those episodes and, and uh, I feel I Sorry if I bummed anybody out, but it, it was for good intentions. Well, I think I think I, I think that like that's what makes Star Trek. I think my my favorite franchise is that it's always allowing those conversations in, both with creators like yourself, us as fans, and even where like Star Trek stumbles, which it has many times. Yeah. <laughs> it, it like we can have the conversation about it because it lets us do that, as opposed to like other franchises where it's sort of like, no, this is the perfect thing as it is. Um, and and so I really uh, I really enjoy that, and I I also really liked too that like. Like um, your show isn't afraid of sex and queerness, which Star Trek has very rarely been afraid of sex. Uh, yeah. But like it, it has had reticence with queerness uh, up until like Discovery. Um, yeah. And so they do an I, amazing job at it, by the way, mm-hmm. where at least like the swings they take on it. I'm always really impressed with how with how unafraid they are to just like dive right in. I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, I think Michelle Paradise is a genius. Like, I love everything she does. I think she's fantastic, too. Like, no, I think, like, that show, I think, is uh, Discovery. I think it just perfectly captures, like, the authenticity of not just queer people, but, like, all the different cultures and backgrounds of people on that show, I think, so wonderfully. I also think they do it in a way that's like, yeah, of course this would be a thing that's going on. Like, nobody Mm -hmm. in that show is, is marking it. Like, it's just, they're so accepting, and it's like... Like that's, I really like stories that are so accepting that it doesn't seem like a big deal. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's really mm-hmm. cool to me. Which is what, which is what Star Trek is. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, with everything with Jennifer and, and all of that, like I, I love, uh, I, I, I love that the show is like willing to showcase a character relationship that is messy, even if it has like missed beat, but like that's again, 22 minute episode. So I understand, even though I will be like, here's my critique, but also I love that there's the conversation about it too. So I think too, that like, I, I, by unexpectedly being a good Star Trek show, it does fight the comedy aspect of it sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that like the comedy aspect is like, get through fast, paint with a broad brush, don't explain everything. And like, but then that's not, 
but the Star Trek is like, I need to know every little piece of everything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I do love that, like, at the end of the day, people talking about Star Trek is something I love. Mm -hmm. So, like, whether you're critiquing it, whether you wish we'd done something differently, if you're celebrating it, if you're finding a background character that you love, like, you know, it's all a part of the conversation, which, like, when we first started making the show, like, I literally was like, God, what if people actually ever talked about this show? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. that'd be amazing. And that like, now it's a double-edged sword. Like people are going to hold us to how they're feeling and that's fine. And I also think the Jennifer stuff comes from an honest place. Cause like, I think that like, there's some people on the internet where like a new character shows up and they're like, somebody should fuck that guy. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and they just say that no matter who it is. Like, if it's cranch, Look, you don't have, you have to call like me out plant. right here like this. All right. <laughs> yeah, There's just a lot of people that are like, cool. I like that character. I'd like to see them. Fuck. You know what I mean? And yeah, like, yeah. that's, the, I can kind of tone that out a bit. Cause I'm like, if you want everybody to fuck all the time, then I kind of don't have to, you're always going to be disappointed. Yeah. You can't always fuck. Every <laughs> yeah. Again, there's somebody out there who's like, I just have to disagree. But anyway, yeah. um, but the but Gene Roddenberry probably would, but <laughs> sure. he, um, well, you know, uh, uh, infinite combinations, but the, um, yeah, yeah. the Jennifer thing isn't that. Like, I think the honest response to the Jennifer thing is like, we did too good of a job on it mm-hmm. to, to have it end like that. And I think yeah. like, you know, when everything comes together and it's like, it's it's like the, the voice performances are lending heart to it and the music and these little moments are working really well. And then when one of the Jennifer stories is in the Deep Space Nine episode, which is so mm-hmm. distractingly Deep Space Nine-y, you're not taking in that there's a thing that's like changing speed there at all. Like you're just, mm-hmm. you're not doubting what we're telling you. So anyway, but like, at the, again, it's wild that I get to do a show where this even comes up. Like it's that, that we're even that we've spent 20 minutes talking about a hot Andorian is fucking awesome. You know what yeah, I mean? No, I love it. Uh, no, I, 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 it's one of the things that I really love about Lower Decks is that there is room for that interpretation. Like for me, and I'm I'm actually curious your thoughts on like this as as like a creator seeing fans take a, a thing and go beyond it, especially within like a franchise like this. Because um, like for me, I read Tendi as transgender, and I don't know if that's the intention mm-hmm. or the in part like what you're trying to do with her character. But like she has a dead name, people in her culture. Um, like she feels ostracized from her culture. She sort of it, she she does not have the female pheromones that we're told that she like other like yeah, Orions yeah. have. So I'm like, oh, is there like is she is she transgender in that aspect? So like yeah. that's my read on the show. I've also heard people talk about uh, Boimler being uh, neurodivergent um, and autistically coded for like missing like the sexual uh, innuendos in like episode one and other places. That's interesting. And then Billups being um, like I, I've seen different reads on Billups either being. Um, uh, 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 celibate or asexual in different yeah. ways and I'm I'm curious yeah. like your thoughts on like people taking those readings of your characters that maybe you had intention to do maybe didn't yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. but like moving beyond it yeah well I'll tell you guys no, the number one with a bullet thing you should remember is that I'm a moron and that, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm I I find things in the show to like to enhance as we're going but like the I'm I'm very stupid and that I just love making <laughs> TV and I like making characters. And when we are learning about the characters as we're going, um, I think what you're saying about Tendi is fascinating. I actually think it's like, it's taking a lot of relatable stuff because like Tendi to some people is a person around a bunch of white people who isn't white. You know what I mean? And yeah, like, yeah. Experience. And then to other people, Tendi is about a woman in STEM and who's coming from a background where she nobody wanted her to be and then mm-hmm. you know to me a lot of the original stuff about tendy was that i wanted her to be so into science and so unlike every orion that we've seen that it starts to chip away at the monocultural stuff that that happened in star trek before and starts to unexpectedly build out cultures and planets in ways like how when you meet people later in life and you find out that you had a privileged or like a, or like an old fashioned view of them. And mm. that like, like celebrating, enhancing that and being okay with finding out that some female Orions don't have pheromones. And that like, you know, even making fun of it of like, some Orions haven't been pirates for over five years, like <laughs> yeah. making fun of myself for undoing what they've done before. And I will, I, I don't think I've said this anywhere else, but like, there's a, a lot of really interesting tendy storyline in season four. Like we dig, 
more into Tendi's backstory than we've ever done. And I don't even know if I should say this, but like, I'm just going to fucking say it. I like your show. Yes. Um, <laughs> season four, for the first time ever, we go to Orion and we tell a story on Orion and we get more about that. So oh, like, that's so cool. I'm very, that's awesome. So the, it's very cool. I love, I love the episode too. But at the same time, what I'd say is no, I did not intend for Tendi to come off as transgender, but I do think mm-hmm. that there are a lot of things in Star Trek and in our lives where we feel like others and we are treated like others. And I think that like other dumb and making people into others that like there's a lot of similarities with different groups that are turned into others and that you can see that people can see themselves in these characters mm-hmm. and that Lower Decks is about finding yourself and defining yourself and, and not letting other people define it and not letting systems define it. That like, I think that there's a lot of honesty in saying, hey, I, and, and by the way. I don't think I should have intended it for you guys to be right. No, but... and I mean, and it's it goes to sorry. I mean, I cut you off. No, 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 like, please, it, please. It goes to like uh, for me, like Tendi is my favorite character on the show and one of my favorites in Star Trek personally. Um, she's right behind you there. Look out! I know she's, she's <laughs> gonna get me. She's gonna get me. Uh, but uh, but it goes to like my own biases. Like I'm as a trans person, like I find those elements of her that like I pick up on and draw out and like, Oh, I see her as trans where someone else will see something different from their own background. And I think it's, it goes to like how we interpret media and the conversation that's created out of it. Um, So it's like, I wasn't necessarily like being like, Oh, I want, I mean, I would, if you like made like Tendi's trans in an episode, I would like be ecstatic about it. But like, it's also not like a requirement for me to be able to invest in her as a character in that way. Well, I love that. And I also love that, like, like something I'm very aware of is like, look, we're doing a comedy, we're painting with a broad brush. And I don't want to like, I don't want to ever seem like I'm getting brownie points by being like, oh, by the way, she's trans when she wasn't mm-hmm. before, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. because like, not only do I find that, like, that's going to create like a weird, like, get out of jail free card for like, making your characters more inclusive after because you did it by accident, which I'm not, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of. But like, at the same time, I also like that we're telling stories about people who you, that, that not only you and I, but like anybody who feels like they were, they were treated as an other, or they didn't fit in or that they had, that they explicitly had to, you know, come out in whatever their own way is, you know, whether it's, whether it's, you know, gender based or whether it's even creativity based, like, moving to LA to work in the arts and everybody back home being like, you're a weirdo or whatever it is in your life. I like that Tendi can be a character along with others, like even Rutherford chain, you know, finding out that Rutherford wasn't who he was before that like, you get to, you get to define who you are. You know what I mean? Like you, nobody knows you better than you. And sometimes it even takes a minute for you to find out who you are, you know, like, and that that's okay. And that in Star Trek, that's okay. Like it's, it's just a part of, the good feelings that Star Trek gives me. You know what I mean? Well, it's it's part of what I love this era, particularly of Star Trek of, like with just not just your show, but with Strange New Worlds, with uh, Discovery, with Picard, with all of them, Prodigy, uh, is that like, I have a greater sense of trust that you want to be inclusive of everybody, um, as opposed to like uh, past Star Treks, which, you know, not to get into any specifics, but like there, there was an element of like, there's clearly some reticence here to display certain things sure. um, on screen. And... So for that, it's like, oh, there's an intentional denial of these aspects. Whereas here, it's like, I feel like those elements are present and part of the world is sometimes explicitly, like in the case of a queer relationship with Jennifer and Mariner or on Star Trek Discovery or even Strange New Worlds where they have uh, uh, like non-binary characters. And so like those things can be explicit, which then when you have things that can be more interpretable, like Tendi might be trans or uh, Phillips might be asexual, that like I trust that we don't need to necessarily like it is good for those communities to have those things defined for them and say like, yeah. you exist here, but also that we can exist as people beyond having to explicitly state our definitions. And the I fact that Star think, Trek is allowing that, I think is yes, great. I think you're right. And I think like, I mean, there's more in the amount of time we have left, there's not yeah. even enough time to be like in the nineties, Star Trek had 50 people giving notes and I have three, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm on a streamer and they were going out to like every household, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. just the, like we still need we still need to hold that stuff accountable and look at it through a lens that like you know is critical but like it's just a different time too that allows me to do that stuff and then on top of that like i just think that it's it's not only that people can find like look whether billups is ace or not 
if you're ace and you love Billups because you see yourself in that character, that's fucking awesome. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And like, I really think that it's not only the characters exhibiting that those qualities that people could see themselves in. It's also how other people are reacting to them on the ship, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, I'll often find myself like in an animatic being like, why does this joke not ring true? Why does this joke feel like it's not what I want to do? Like there's a moment in, uh, in uh, Paradoxus, Crisis Point 2, where uh, Boimler and Mariner are in this little prison cell and uh, they get busted out by uh, Knickknack, right? Who, who like, he's like, I, well, I love Knickknack, by the way. I love Knickknack too. And there was this moment where he's like, Knickknack is like, I'm, I love you. I'm in love with you. And originally, Boimler's reaction was like, oh, all right, buddy, uh, let's just keep doing the movie. And I was like, why is it weird? that Boimler's reacting like that. It's not funny to me. It doesn't feel right. And I was like, oh, because Knickknack expressing love for him wouldn't be something Boimler would react like that to. Yeah. Like, I love you too, Knickknack. Let's do it. Like, it's <laughs> like, that's what feels good about, that's like the first season episode where where whenever Rutherford's trying to quit his jobs and he keeps being, and everybody keeps being like, you gotta be true to yourself, you know? And that's like, it's comedic in a TV show that everybody would be so easy to fall in love and try things and be supportive of each other and that's that's part of the irony of getting to do star trek like that's that's the comedy of star trek is playing with your expectations of our lives where everybody has opinions and wants to tell you what to do or who to be and how to be and that like Mm -hmm. in starfleet it's like nobody cares if you're dating a cat or like all (laughs) they care about is if you are being a good part of the crew that you are like you're, you're, you're helping you're carrying up the community find is important right like yeah that's the only thing you can get demerit points for everything else is like is fine with everybody and that's a good feeling yeah i i agree and it's just it's it's just fun to see the way that um lord x like I, I just love seeing the characters just constantly grow in a way that feels um truthful to who they are um like i i was even surprised when i was writing my review i was sort of like writing the, about the episode with rutherford uh mm-hmm. reflections and i was like oh this is kind of like imposter syndrome made manifest which mm-hmm. is something that he expressed in episode uh season two yeah. that he was also feeling i'm like oh so the, like this theme of like him facing his past self is a is a, like an expression of something he's already expressed and i like just seeing like oh this is the evolution of these characters that feels natural and and, and, and like carries them through from season one to season three and like if you looked at like the show and being and said like here's where they are at this episode and here's where they are now it's like oh there's not much change there are ensigns um in in both episodes but it's like no they've completely changed in a way that if they reacted this way i i wouldn't believe that now even though they might have reacted that way in episode one and by the way it doesn't who you are is not based on your rank or your job right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. it's whether like I was an assistant for so many years because of uh, because of um, um, the first time the economy collapsed and like well not the first time but like the last time it did and then uh, and then there was a writer strike and just like I was stuck 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 and it was like you know <clears throat> I was like God I feel like I'm behind but that's when I was writing TNG season eight and like if that stuff hadn't happened if I hadn't been stuck at a desk then like getting coffee and answering calls I never would have been rewatching TNG, writing TNG season eight, and eventually getting my own Star Trek show. And it's like, I was an assistant during all of that, but like these characters, it doesn't matter. Their rank doesn't, ma- it matters to Boimler, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> Yeah, you know, that they're ensigns. Like that's why the, that's why these shows are so rich. And that's why you can love these characters, even if they're not in charge of other people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I, Star Trek's great. <laughs> it's freaking wonderful um well i know you have to run in just a minute so is there anything that i didn't touch upon that you wanted to talk about or that you think oh people should, should know that you haven't had a chance to say dang that's a question i always ask people and it's i'm always like ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no i mean not really i i think that like you know i'll, I'll promote season four just a little bit because it's written please. and we're working on it and um Season four rules. It's very like uh, wage douche flavored in a way. Good, and you'll, yeah. you'll see what I mean when you when you start seeing cuts of it. But like, um, I'm really proud of the show. I when whenever we talk, I don't get a chance to say like the art team on the show is magnificent. I love mm-hmm. working with them. I love hanging out with them. 
Uh, Nolan Obena, who's our art director, is just an amazing guy and an amazing artist. Uh, Barry Kelly, who's our producer and supervising director, who like helps you know direct and like guide every episode. Our CG team, our ship designers, our character designers. Like, I really, I'm so proud of working with everybody. I just think they did an amazing job. Like that peanut hamper episode, whether you like it or not, it's a fucking gorgeous episode. It's beautiful, you know? yeah. And <clears throat> I think they're gonna just. It's just going to keep looking better and better. And I'm just so happy. And then Chris Westlake for the music, all the writers, obviously, Tony, Jack, Noel, you know, Eugene, everybody, Jerry and Don, like, I just love working with with everybody and Fred and just, you know, Jillian Vigman. Like, I, I am so lucky, like, like, people just don't know. I always say how lucky I am to be working on a show like this. But like, it's so rare to get to work on a dream show, have it work. So that you didn't then leave and go, well, I can never watch Star Trek again because I'm pissed off. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. like I ruined it for myself. Yeah. I ruined it for myself. I can never watch Star Trek. You know what I mean? Like, and now I'm like, I love the show we made. I love all the people that are working on it. Like, I'm really proud of it. I have a whole other season of it coming. And then I get to talk to you and I get to see fans interacting. And like, I get to go to like Star Trek conventions and just be around people that like, like when I very first sold the show, I remember saying, there was like a meeting with like all of the the people that are like not just merchandise but like all the people that do like like stuff related to making stuff outside of the shows like the cruises and and the games and mm -hmm. and i remember like presenting the concept of the show to them with a little bit of art and being like not that any of them have made any toys or anything but somebody please make lower decks toys i would love i will it. buy i will buy all of them i will buy all of it too there's two buyers listening. here um, <laughs> But then I remember telling them that like, it used to be that in a room full of people, I'd be lucky to find somebody who knew who Worf was. Mm -hmm. And that getting to do a show that puts me in rooms of people who not only know Worf, but also love Worf and know Jadzia and Ezri and know like, you know, the Dura assist, like everybody, like getting to make a Star Trek show puts me in rooms with people who love Star Trek and gets to make new Star Trek fans. And it's, I never thought I'd get that. And I'm so like the, like you guys don't know how lucky I am. Like I, I so appreciate getting to be a part of it. Like it is, it's bonkers. So I, I'm, I hope people like this season and I hope they like next season too. <laughs> I, I I know people of I loved this season. I adore it. And I'll, I'll end out because I know we're already over time, but I'll end out. And I know I've said this to you face to face before, but I, I always want to reiterate, like legitimately all that love that you have and that everyone on the show has for like Star Trek. I adore because it just it, it feels like the show is just matching this this love that I've had my entire life and I actually get to see it on screen. And That's then it actually just true. be a great like show that not only feels um like it, it reflects that at me but also is is just a great story on its own like if you removed all the references removed the star trekiness of it yes it's yeah. still a great show um and it just like reminds me of my hope and like love for other people and the future like like legitimately um it's been it's been a shitty year for like like just everything stuff for everyone <laughs> Yeah. Like every every time I watch this lower decks, I just I come away feeling not only happier, just personally, but like, oh, the world can be good because there are people who both make the show and are reflected in the show that believe in that sense of community and a better. There future. can be ten weeks of fun of the year. The rest of the year, <laughs> yeah, it's all there can be ten lower decks weeks, and then there's the rest. It's all Star Wars Andor, and just fascism is is awful. There's some good shows. <laughs> Listen, everything sucks. I love but Andor, there's some good shows out there, and. And I appreciate you, Jesse, and I love coming and talking to you. And and I will tell Brad you said hi, even though Please you still. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> screw Brad. Who, uh, hey, Brad. You know, I was I was gonna make a joke earlier when you're like saying oh, everyone's great, it's, except for Brad. <laughs> no, 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 no Brad, Brad's great. Brad's great. Brad's wonderful. Um, so. And uh, and yeah, just thank you, thank you for, you know, thank you for continuing to watch the show with a critical eye and and you know being generous with your time. And uh, I hope everybody just watches. Lots of Star Trek all the time. Oh, I have one more thing to plug. Yes, please. I got, I, I actually called Paramount Plus and I was like, we just ended the season. Can we get a binge code so that everybody who hasn't seen the show I saw, can yeah, binge yeah. the whole, and they gave it to me today. I just tweeted it. But if you go to uh, Paramount Plus, if you can get a friend, I'm like, if everybody just tells one of their nerd friends to just push through and binge as much, like they're going to love the show. Mm -hmm. uh, 
wait, wait, wait. Let me pull it up so I don't say it wrong. But you we and I'll we put it, I'll put it also uh in oh, thank the you, description thank you. and I'll put it on screen too. So yeah, so we got uh I got them to make a special code for us. Uh it's STLD22. You get a month free of Paramount Plus, and everybody who signs up for that is gonna be an indicator to them that they should pick us up for more seasons. Like that's mm. the kind of sneaky, you know, thing I know they're watching. So like I'm hoping people like jump in and check it out and 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 use that because like that that would be great for us because i want to tell a lot more stories yeah well i will make sure to push it and i will share it because i you. i Thank want you. you to go for seven seasons and four movies so i know <laughs> and right more, hopefully. me too i want to do a series a weird, 20 years from now <laughs> i want to do like an old weird starbase 80 like like spin-off three episode thing <laughs> like yeah. you know i want to do all sorts of weird stuff uh, uh, but thank you, thank you. I have I have to jump because yes, I have please. writers that want me. But uh, as usual, this has been a pleasure. Thank you. It's so been much. an absolute pleasure, and thank you for everything. And tell everybody, including Brad, uh, that thank all you for work. all their hard work. So I really I will, do I appreciate it. So all right, all right. I'll tell them. Thank all you. Right. Talk to you later. Bye.